hopefully there will not be a trade or anything wacky happening with the 2014 NBA draft. As always, a tradition. We don't have a lot of traditions on the BS Report, but one of them is on Draft Week. Our friend Chad Ford from ESPN.com comes on, and we talk about the draft. How are you? Good, Bill. Great to be back. Um, craziest draft we've had since I've known you? I think it's one of the best drafts we've had since known it. So the craziness last year was crazy because nobody wanted to make a pick. Uh, no one liked the draft. No one liked the players in the draft. And I, I thought there was a certain insanity that went with that. Uh, I've never, never felt so much disinterest. This year, I think there's so many players that people like. Uh, and at the same time, there's a, a combination of teams that want to be good now and want to try to turn those high-value picks into players. That, yeah, this could end up being the craziest draft ever because there's a lot of teams trying to move in and a lot of teams trying to move out. How much of it has to do with fear of when you have this many prospects, especially like after you get through the top three and there's five or six clear-cut guys in the next group, all of whom you can make a case for, and then if you even wanted to bring in Alfred Payton and you wanted to bring in Saric and you wanted to bring in Stauskas, like, who the hell knows who the be- who the fourth best player is in this draft? How much of it is fear with these teams that they just don't want to take the wrong guy? Yeah, you get a certain sense of that. I, th- I think you get a certain sense of that in every uh, in every draft. Uh, as as you've pointed out many times, uh, a lot of these general managers are more concerned about preserving their jobs than necessarily doing the right thing or being bold. So there's always that that anxiety there. I mean, you know, I hear this every year, the team that gets the number one pick immediately goes into depression because there's so much pressure on them now. And, and, and what if they get it wrong? And there's other teams that don't go number one that are almost relieved that they didn't go number one because a guy will fall to them and they don't have criticism over who they take anymore. So, I mean, I think it's there. I think this is a little bit different. I mean, there's so many similarities from last year's draft and that last year, the anxiety was, I don't think I can get this right. No matter who I take, I'm going to get criticized for it. This year, I think there's a lot of people that feel like, I'm not sure you can get this wrong. And yeah, there might be variations of good in this draft. But as long as I get a good player in this draft, the criticism's going to be muted. You only really get criticized when you draft a bust. Uh, you know, if someone's a triple and I draft a double, you know, the criticism isn't going to be that high. And so I, I actually think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this draft. I think this draft goes about nine players deep of people who could could be an all-star someday. And then yep. we, you and I both know that there'll be one or two other guys that we're not even talking about in that vein that will end up being better than a couple of those guys. But I don't, I don't see a lot of bust potential uh, in this draft. Obviously, Joel Embiid now with his foot injury uh, and, and, you know, other concerns about, you know, his back and everything else. Obviously, there's some potential there. But for the rest of these guys, great character, hard workers, all have something that they can do well at the next level that, that translates over. Uh, I think teams one through nine are going to get good players. Yeah, I think if you're looking at busts, and I, and I don't think there's a really great candidate to be a bust out of the top nine other than Vonley, just because of what he did in college, which wasn't much. Now, I've heard all the cases for why he didn't do much. His coach didn't use him correctly. They couldn't get him the ball. Like, they didn't run plays for him, all that stuff. Like, I've heard all of it. I'm just saying he put up an 11 and nine and his team didn't make the tournament. So that, that's a, that's a red flag. And I think Exum's a red flag because of the Australia thing. Who the hell knows? I know he, I know everybody loves him, but he's still from another country and we just don't know. Um, Marcus Smart, not totally sure what his position is. It doesn't seem like he's a point guard. I still like him, but he, I could see that being a possible, uh, red flag. And then Gordon can't shoot yet. Um, I mean, you could go down the line and pick everyone apart, but I'm like you. I like, I really like the top nine. I like every player. Probably I like Vonley the least. Who do you like the least out of the top nine? Out of the top nine, the guy that I like the least. Uh, that's tough. Um, and, you know, we're. Put, I, I think, I don't know about you, but I, I have Sarich at nine, and now that Sarich is going to Europe for a couple of years, that. Uh, that, that that concerns me. I, I would probably have said in some ways he's my least least favorite uh, of that group. I, I'm not concerned about Vonley. Uh, I, I think if you part of it's just the sheer number of minutes that he played. 
on a, on mm. an Indiana team. I mean, his per forty minute numbers are almost identical to Julius Randle's as rebounding and scoring and 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 everything else. And he was a much better shot blocker. Uh, and the advanced metrics, I'll actually say that Vonley had one of the best uh, seasons of anybody in college basketball. Not as worried about him. Uh, I've always been a little bit worried about uh, about Randall's ability uh, to, to finish over length, uh, and, and that's concerned me a bit. And, and now that there's some questions about his foot as well, you, you hate to hear about feet or backs with big men. Uh, <laughs> so you really hate to hear about Joe Embiid in this draft then? Oh, it's crushed, crushed, uh, <laughs> crushing because, you know, if you know him, you know he's a great young man. Yeah. And if you watched him play, you know that that wasn't hyperbole to say that he reminded you of a young Hakeem Olajuwon. And all the, all the physical tools were there for him to have an unbelievable NBA career and to, to have these back issues, to, to have the foot issues. Uh, it sounds like there might be several other things that are going to going to come out about Embiid that that aren't as scary as that, but but add to the the mixture of of things that people are concerned about with him. It's it's that that's not how you want to have to evaluate a prospect on, on that. Are you talking level. about you're talking about the bone density stuff? Yeah, there's stuff about that. I think there's some blood work issues as well. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon for um, um, athletes who grew up in Africa to um, test positive for hepatitis. Uh, you know, for example, um, and, you know, some of it has to do with diet, not uncommon uh, for there to be uh, anemic issues and, and, and things like that. So, um, you know, there, I think there's, there's enough stuff there that, that, that scares you a bit. Um, but there's also hope that, you know, now that he's over here, starts eating right, gets in the right training regimen, lets his body frame grow into to you know he, he was growing so much you know at the time that you know maybe these will be temporary growing pains and the uh, mb will be fine in a few years and i know a number, number of general managers who think that way because i think he goes top 10 i watched him work out a week before you and i thought he was a seven foot one serge Ibaka. i was blown away which you know people have gotten into a lot of trouble over the years getting blown away by a workout but <laughs> Just seemed like such a great athlete, super coachable. I love the way he carried himself. He's making jokes. I, I liked everything I saw. He could shoot with both hands. He could shoot threes. And I left that workout thinking, there's no way that guy's not going to be the number one pick. And now he is not going to be the number one pick. Um, I still don't think he goes lower than three. What do you think? I, I think... Based off of just what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing now, and you got to remember, a lot of these teams they haven't seen his medicals yet. Arn Tellum is still his agent is still trying to figure out exactly how he's going to handle that and what teams he's going to send it to and and what he's going to give. And so there's a bit of a rumor mill going on now, and and the Cavs have remained pretty tight lipped about what they've seen. As have the Bucks, the only two teams that that have uh, that, that have his medicals. But I think the more they're digging and the more they're talking to team doctors, uh, the more squeamish they're getting. You know, five hours after this all went down, I think every general manager outside of John Hammond of the Bucks and, and David Griffin of the Cavs was like, we'll take him if he falls, uh, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll take him no matter what. And now their doctors are talking about this particular type of fracture. And now they're you know, looking at the other issues and why did he have a back fracture and then a foot fracture and what's going on with the skeletal structure or what's going on with the way he moves and the torque he's putting on his body and other things that are causing those injuries and, and what else is going on. And I, I think there's some cold feet right now. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he went to Philly at three or Orlando at four. I wouldn't be shocked if he was at, you know, Boston took him at six and I wouldn't even be shocked if it was, he was Philly's pick at 10. I, I think that's the range, and that's a pretty wide range. But part of it is until these teams see those medical records and until their doctors get a look and a handle around it, uh, they're speculating just like you and I are. I can't imagine he doesn't go in the top six. I, if Boston passes on him, I'll be pissed. Uh, well, it fits Danny Ainge. I mean, it, it, you know, Danny has, has never been shy. Uh, about about gambling and taking a guy that he felt was an asset. I, I like Ainge's approach often is that to think about picks and players as assets yeah. and and trying to get a high value asset and, and don't worry necessarily about fit or don't worry about, you know, a red flag here or there. You take an asset and, you know, they're not always going to work out, but more often than not, I think they have worked out for him. 
And yeah, I'd be shocked too. Uh, if he if he passes on Embiid at six, then you I know think you know bad. that it's bad. Right. And plus, aren't tell him if he if uh, I tweeted this a couple of days ago. If if he didn't think Embiid was going one, he wanted him to play in Boston or L.A. Boston because um, just the organization they have in L.A. because that's where tell him and his whole operation is located. The Lakers, all that stuff. But um, I I just keep going. I go back to two things. One. When I saw the doubleheader in Chicago, which you were at as well, so I always trust my eye test when I'm watching these guys. And just watching Embiid run up and down, I just thought he looked like a gazelle. It, it was like the exact opposite that I felt when I watched Odin for the first time in person, where I was like, oh, man, there's Odin just had a lot of parts moving in different directions, you know? And it didn't – you see guys like this sometimes, like Kelly Olynyk, like this, like – but there's all kind of guys where you just watch them run. It's like an effort for them to get up and down the court and their body just wasn't totally meant to play basketball, but they're making the best out of it. And beat. I just felt like the same way I do when I watch somebody like Serge Ibaka or Blake Griffin just seemed like he was meant to be on a basketball court running up and down. Like it was just so effortless for him. And so when you talk about like when teams are looking about, is there something structurally wrong? I would go the other way. Maybe he just hurt his back. He fell. Um, maybe he broke his foot because he broke his foot. Like Michael Jordan broke his foot. He broke the same bone. So I I don't know. I, I just – I really don't think structurally there's something wrong, but I might be wrong. What do you think on that? I I, I, I agree with you that he's, he's certainly not awkward. In fact, he's incredibly fluid. And, and I think one theory that I've had posted to me by a team uh, and their team doctor is that his body was growing at such a rapid rate, but he, he remains a very good athlete that he was putting torque on a body that was still growing uh, yeah. and putting an unbelievable torque on it because of his uh, athleticism. Uh, but, you know, he's gaining weight and he's getting heavier and his frame's growing and, and what have you, and that this was causing the fractures, but you strengthen his core uh, and, you know, you get that strengthened and he quits growing and you get him on a right nutritional plan, and, and all this stuff goes away. Um, and so, I, I, mean, I mean, to your point, I think that that's the hope. Uh, look, I hope he pans out, because I, 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 do, I don't love lumbering big men, but big men that play the way he plays, the way that Hakeem Olajuwon play, I think it's a joy to watch players like that play. And yeah. I think whoever gets him, uh, it'll be him and Anthony Davis, as, you know, the two big guys going forward in the NBA draft that are going to continue you know, going to dominate. And I think whoever has those guys are going to have players that are going to help them win championships. So when we thought Embiid was going first before all this stuff happened, um, Parker was going second to Milwaukee. That yes. was happening. Um, and it was happening for a couple of reasons. One, great character kid, um, played in Chicago, which is, you know, came from Chicago, four straight high school titles, 80 miles away from Milwaukee. So, quote unquote, homegrown kid, even though he's not necessarily from Wisconsin, but he's in the area. There's a lot of Chicago fans who live in the Milwaukee area and so on and so on. Um, the, the quote unquote surest thing, just kind of you know what he is. Like he's, he's going to end up being some sort of version of Glenn Robinson, Paul Pierce, Rudy Gay, whoever. Like he's just in that phylum. Um, and then number four, like he, he was out of shape last year because he hurt his foot last summer. Um, I think people look at him. And they see the body that he's going to have five years from now when he's got a trainer, when he's eating right, when he's just this honed physical specimen. And Milwaukee was taking him, too. So now Embiid goes out. Now it looks like Parker's going one. So that means two teams have decided Parker over Wiggins, basically. Why Parker over Wiggins? Well, there's two things. I'm hearing and uh, reported this, uh, you know, reported Monday morning that, that the Cavs were leaning Parker. I'll, I'll put two caveats. Uh, uh, not proud of this, uh, but I've whiffed on three out of the last four Cavs picks completely. I think everyone else has too. I didn't have them. So have they. I didn't have them take. Yeah, so have they. Maybe that. Maybe there's a, uh, a connection between those two. Uh, but I. Uh, I didn't have them taking Anthony Bennett one. Uh, I did not have them taking Dion Waiters. And uh, I did not have them taking Tristan Thompson. Did have them taking Kyrie Irving, but so did everyone else. Uh, except you. Uh, right. uh, I, uh, that's true. I did. Well, I liked Derek. I didn't trust the Kyrie Irving 10 games in college thing. And I really liked Derek Williams. I just yeah, didn't yeah. think it was a I, slam dunk. 
I remember. Uh, but well, this, I, let's, have, let's have Kyrie Irving win 35 games in a season before I take a loss on that one. Okay, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, and so, you know, from, I, I, can, I can understand that there's not a huge amount of credibility for me telling anybody what the Cavs are going to do other right. than there's a new front office, and, uh, and the old front office was, was, was quite de- deceptive. But also I'll say that Dan Gilbert kept getting involved in those decisions, and a lot of those decisions were draft day decisions that were often being orchestrated by coaches and, ma- and, and ownership and less to do with what management was thinking or wanting to do. Uh, and, and I think that's just something that you have to figure out with Cleveland is that they have an owner who, at the end of the day, gets involved in these decisions in ways that sometimes other owners don't. And uh, But it looks like they're leaning Parker. And I think the, the most obvious thing to say is they've whiffed on some of these guys. Parker's the surest thing in the draft. They're going to lose Luel Dang. He plays the three, the position that, that they want. He can play right now, and this is a team that wants to make the playoffs. He has high character uh, in, a, in, a, in a locker room that didn't necessarily uh, exhibit that last year. And, you know, this is a... And, and all of those things speak to Jabari. I disagree with the people, though, that say that he's the best fit there. Uh, and, I, and I disagree for a couple of reasons. One, they were terrible defensively last year. And uh, Wiggins is not going to be a great defender, especially if you're going to try to get him to guard threes. He just doesn't have the lateral quickness and foot speed, I think, to, to be a great, a great defender at three. Uh, you, two, you, you meant Parker doesn't have the foot speed. Yeah, yeah, Parker. Parker, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, two, uh, he's a... Um, uh, he, he's, he's a guy whose best attribute is that he really scores the basketball and, and he can score in a variety of ways. But Kyrie Irving likes the ball in his hands and he's the scorer. Deion Waiters is a gunner uh, who is going to try to score a lot of baskets as well. Uh, scoring wasn't the biggest issue for Cleveland last year. And uh, defense was. And, uh, and, and Anthony Bennett, by the way, who they've gotten slimmed down and haven't written off yet, uh, he's primarily an offensive weapon in many ways, a very similar player to, to Jabari Parker, uh, big kind of a tweener. Um, you're not sure whether he's not always a three or a four probably plays like a three, but maybe, maybe is physically more capable of playing the four defensively. Uh, now they've got all these guys. To me, Wiggins is the guy who comes in and adds defense right away, adds elite athleticism to this team. Uh, and, and, and maybe helps in, day one right away because he adds a defensive presence to this team. I, I, I would take Wiggins. I, I think I've made that clear, but I, I understand why they're taking Parker. I, I think Milwaukee, you're right, would have taken Parker uh, at number one had they gotten number one and, and certainly would have taken him at number two. And I think Jabari's going to be good. But look, when he weighs 255 right now, 254. It's big for a small forward. It's big. Yeah. And uh, he's been working out in L.A. for the past, what, eight weeks? Um, with a professional trainer. Uh, I'm not sure that his body type is the type that slims down when he's lifting weights and working out. I, I'm not sure that his body type, just when you look at his trunk and his hips and everything else, is the type that he's going to be He's going to be a big guy. Uh, and and that, that's his body speaking. And, and, and I know the, the Bucks especially were looking at him and, and projecting him to be a four in the league, not a three. Offensively, he would play much more like a three. But defensively, they felt like he had to play four. And that, that, that scares me a little bit. I think he's a stretch four. I, I, I don't think – I think ultimately, if you're winning with him, that's where he plays. Um, and you mentioned something, and in, in you did – you're up to mock draft 9.0. You, you, you routinely get in the double, double digits with the mock drafts, right? Uh, 10. Or, I, always, I try to get to 10. Okay. So 9.0 went up today on ESPN.com. So you're listening to this on a Tuesday, so it was yesterday. You said you thought there was a feeling that Jabari might have tanked his Cleveland workout intentionally. That's that's uh, that's the, the signal uh, that I got from two different sources in in Cleveland. The workout did not go well, uh, that he didn't shoot the ball well and, and got a little winded and just didn't seem as engaged as they expected him to be based off of all their scouting with a player. And the, the literally the word tank was used by one of the sources that I talked to uh, in the workout. And there, uh, I have another source around Parker's camp that says that there is a preference with Parker to go to Milwaukee uh, over Cleveland. Mm. And uh, now I don't necessarily mean that, that he tanked it. I, I, don't, I have no idea whether he 
intentionally went in and tried not to be his best in that workout or not. I, I, Maybe I don't his heart have wasn't evidence. in it. What? Maybe his heart wasn't in it. Maybe his heart wasn't in it, exactly. Um, I think he would like to go to Milwaukee at two. And, uh, but, I, you know, I don't think that will dissuade Dan Gilbert from taking the guy that he wants to take at one. I don't think Parker will be a problem in Cleveland. I don't think he'll, you know, speak out or act out if the Cavs take him number one. And so I just can't imagine that that will be a factor that Cleveland will take into consideration what Parker wants or doesn't want. So here's, thank God I'm here because I la- I root for good basketball and I root for the right guys to go to the right teams. It's clear that Cleveland should take Wiggins. It's yeah. clear that Milwaukee should end up with Parker. That's just how this needs to play out. All right, so let's figure it out. How does this happen? Why can't they swap picks? Why can't Cleveland say, you know what? We're going to pass on. We know you want your buyer. We're just going to, we're going to take Wiggins or we're going to flip picks with you. You take Wiggins first. We'll take Jabbar second. We'd love to get rid of Jared Jack's contract that we never should have signed. Why don't you take Jared Jack's contract off our hands? And we'll and we'll call it a day. There you go. And we both end up with, with guys we like. Why can't that happen? I think it could. Uh, I, I've, I've raised the issue with both teams. Uh, they haven't spoken to each other. Cleveland has talked to Philly. They've talked to Orlando. They've talked to Utah. Milwaukee's talked to those same teams about moving down a few spots. They haven't spoken with each other. You know, this is a competitive thing, as you know, Bill. Uh, and I, I think there's people in Milwaukee that think the Jabari thing's a smokescreen. Uh, I think they feel like uh, that that they don't really want Jabari, but they know that Milwaukee really wants him, and so they're trying to get something out uh, of Milwaukee. And I know there's people in Cleveland that think that the whole Andrew Wiggins thing is a smokescreen from Milwaukee because they haven't really been that high on Wiggins all right. year in Milwaukee. Uh, and they had loved Dante Exum, and that them saying that they would take Wiggins at two is also a bit of a smokescreen that they'll be happy with either guy. I've heard accusations come both directions from both of these teams, which makes it makes it tough to do a deal because Milwaukee has to take on what the next two years of Jared Jack's contract. I think the lot, the next two years are guaranteed. Yeah, uh, on a on a rebuilding team where he clearly won't want to be there, and yeah, you could, you could they have to do that to get the guy they think they should get anyway. So you have, I think, there's a little bit of a game of chicken going on because. Let's just look at this logically. Jabari Parker does not make sense for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And for all the reasons you just pointed out, they have a bunch of shoot first guys. They have a bunch of guys who aren't that good on defense, but can score. It's ridiculous. I don't understand how you could play at the same time. Who the hell are they going to guard? Like when they guard Kevin Durant, how are they guarding Kevin Durant or Paul George or whoever with those two guys as their forwards? Um, if anything, Wiggins is a really nice fit for them because, as you pointed out, he's an excellent defender already. He's going to kind of pick and choose his spots. He drifts out of games. He doesn't need the ball. Um, he has the, a higher upside, I think we'd all agree, than Jabari. Um, I, it just makes more sense to take him. I don't understand how to land on Jabari. I don't get it. Hey, I'm sure there's something I'm missing, but I just don't see it. I think Wiggins makes much more sense for them. I'm confused as well. That's why I've had Wiggins there at one. I had a Cavs source tell me on lottery night, uh, obviously they were surprised to get the number one pick. But while Jabari is sort of set up atop their board all year because, you know, they were just, you know, that was Chris Grant and thinking was, you know, he fits a need and helps us right away that they thought at the end of the day, Wiggins would, would Wiggins or Embiid, if he tested out okay um, from a health perspective, would, would, would rise to the top. Uh, all I know is that the Cavs have been a very screwy organization for a while. And, and look, nobody's going to be able to criticize them if they get Jabari because Jabari's going to be good. He's going to have a really good NBA career, and he's going to be good. Uh, but Wiggins, for all those reasons, make more sense. And here's the other one that I just don't understand. All these people that are saying, well, Jabari is a culture guy, and so he's going to come in there and be able to stand up to Kyrie Irving and all these guys. First of all, when do, when do rookies come right. in and do, and, and do that on an established team? That's, that's, that's just a, a, not an understanding of how an NBA team works. Um, second of all, why would your team want their rookie to be the guy that has to come in and clean up the locker room with a bunch of veterans that are already on, on this roster? And, and the other thing is, if you knew Jabari, yes, he is an alpha dog on the floor, but he's actually pretty shy and quiet in person. 
Uh, he's not an outspoken guy. He's not necessarily a guy who's going to be super vocal uh, in the locker room. That That's not his personality. He is an alpha dog on the floor, but but off the floor, not so much. And I know people look, well, Wiggins is quiet and Wiggins is unassuming and he fits in. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's not like Jabari's going to go in there and get uh, get Dion Waiters and Kyrie Irving to clean up the BS that went last, last year. I, I, Luel Dang, who is by all accounts one of the greatest, of the greatest locker guys ever. room guys yeah. ever in the NBA, yeah. couldn't do it. Right. And he's, Jabari's going to do Dang it? Is, Luel Dang is one of the greatest human beings alive, much less one of the greatest NBA players alive. Um, somebody needs to remind Jabari that Larry Sanders and O.J. May are on that Bucks team. I'm not positive he knows this because if he's trying to get to Milwaukee, I just think he thinks maybe gone. somebody should He say, thinks they're gone. <laughs> then they will be. I'm sure they will be. Well, if they take Jabari, they have to do something. And I, I don't know what that is. They're going to be able to move um, Larry Sanders. They won't get they won't get much back in return. They may even have to take a bad contract back or something, but they'll be able to move Larry Sanders. O.J. Mayo, that might be tougher. Uh, well, Mayo, again, Mayo might be redeemable if he shows up not 25 pounds overweight with a bad attitude. Maybe he, maybe he'll be in shape this season. Yeah, Got maybe. that going for him. <laughs> Larry Sanders needs to go. And what makes me mad is I, I can already see it. I know the Mavericks are going to trade for him, and it'll be some garbage one-sided trade, and he's going to turn his life around and be great for them. It'll be somebody like that. It's just his second stop, he'll be really good. And he'll get everything together, and he'll be like, oh, my God, they stole Larry Sanders. How did that happen? Unless that's he goes what, to that's the my fear. Unless he goes well, to unless, the Well, unless, yeah. And I, I think a, that's a, the most likely stop for him right now. All right, this is a good tangent. With the, the Kings at number eight, clearly want to trade that pick. The owner is, is classic new owner, just wants to make a move to make a move, not thinking big picture long term, wants to make a splash. He's like the irrational confidence owner. He's ready to trade that pick for anything. Who does that pick go for? Because I feel like if the Celtics don't get Kevin Love, that's a Rondo destination. And I actually think the Kings would trade for Rondo and roll the dice for a year that that they can make him happy and keep him. What do you think? I, I do. I, I look. They were willing to do that for Love. Uh, yeah. They they were willing to to make that trade and 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 try to convince Love to stay, uh, and and use the number eight pick. I think this, the Celtics one is a good one. I, I subscribe to the notion that Ainge is going to do something with this team. If he can, if he can add love and, and put together a team that can tend in the East, he'll do it. But if he can't, if he can't get that caliber of player, he moves Rondo and Jeff Green and, and, and goes all the way the other direction. Uh, I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, at the end of the summer, the Celtics will be one, one direction or the other. I don't think they'll be what they were this year. Um, I'd be totally happy if we ended up with six, eight, and seventeen, and and just a total reboot. Sign me up. This is a great draft. You can do that. What is your gut feeling? Hey, another tangent. It it really does feel like Minnesota and Golden State are just staring at each other right now. Oh, they're um, gonna do a deal. Just get, get a room. They're gonna already. right. Uh, it's I mean, gonna happen, on. right? They, they, they've agreed okay. on the principles. Uh, I, I mean, I I know there's now this. We're, we're not gonna move Clay Thompson. They they. They've agreed on on Kevin Love and Kevin Martin, and they've agreed on David Lee and Clay Thompson. They are fighting over draft protections on draft picks, whether Harrison Barnes will or won't be in there, whether Berea will or won't be in this deal. My, my experience is when, when you've got the principles down, and these two teams want the principles on each side, there's no question that Minnesota wants Clay Thompson, and there's no question that Golden State wants Kevin Love. There's no question Kevin Love wants to go to Golden State, so his agent is pushing, pushing, pushing. And there's no I, – I think it's not a surprise that Clay Thompson wants to go to Minnesota because he knows he'll get a bigger contract there than he'll get in Golden State because they can't afford to um, throw huge, huge money his way. Uh, I think you're going to see uh, – you're going to see a deal uh, at some point. If My they don't, it's be... pure stubbornness because that's the best deal that both sides are going to get. Well, my guess would be this This is the trade that I fear. First of all, I'm shocked that Clay Thompson's involved because, you know, I know when Steve Kirk took that job, one of the things he was worried about was all the chefs in the kitchen. So then within a month, you have seven chefs in the kitchen, all of whom have different opinions on whether Clay Thompson should be in this deal. Um, and, and from what everybody is hearing, the owner, 
thinks Clay Thompson should be in the deal, which means Clay Thompson's going to be in this deal because ultimately it's his team. But I think what the trade that makes the most sense, Love Martin, Lee Thompson, and then they stick him with Berea's contract and that trade exception they have. And that, and that basically the Warriors would be taking on $26 million and they'd be giving back 16. So they'd be taking on 10 million in salary. And the T-Wolves would be dumping a con- dumping two contracts that they don't want. They'd be major upgrade at shooting guard to Clay Thompson. And then you think Lee could do 74% of Kevin Love stats? 8% of Kevin Love stats? And then they'd have enough money to go. It actually makes sense on paper. I like the trade more for Golden State than Minnesota, but it, it makes sense, right? It, it, it's one of those deals. You get it for both sides. Flip Saunders, if he's going to coach this team, does not want to coach a bunch of rookies and and be the worst team in the West. He wants to be a playoff team. Unfortunately, every single team in the West right now wants to be a playoff team, which means there's intense competition there. There's not one team right now in the West that says, yeah, we're going to tank it this year. Uh, you know, yeah. Utah's trying to get better right away. Sacramento's trying to get better uh, you know, right away. Minnesota's trying to trying to move into the playoffs. I mean, we go through the whole list. They, every team is trying. Lakers are going to try, uh, uh, you know, to get better this year and, and be back in the playoffs again. There's there's going to be, as you and I know, seven teams that aren't going to make the playoffs in the West. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to probably even be more competitive next year because these, these lottery teams are, are trying so hard. Somebody's not going to make the playoffs. I imagine Minnesota will be one of those teams, but at least they won't be be awful. If Golden we State, gotta be talk- can, we got to be talking draft, Bill. No, I know, but if Golden State can make a trade that that ultimately gives them Kevin Love and Stephen Curry, they got to do it. I don't think it's going to win them the title next year because they're going to be too bad defensively. But long term, you got to make that trade. Um, and, and and just one other caveat, and this this will probably take us an hour. But the other thing is, if you have Steph Curry and if you have Kevin Love, why isn't Golden State a compelling destination for LeBron? Uh, oh wow. Because uh, the great market, uh, Steve Kerr, co- good coach, Stephen Curry, Kevin Love, two two players that are better right now. Steph Curry's better than Dwayne Wade. Kevin Love's better than Chris Bosh. And yeah. uh, and in Golden State, if they do that deal, you know, if they don't take on Berea, uh, can uh, move and Andre Iguodala to a team with cap space. Uh, they can move them. Uh, they can yeah. move other players. If they can move Harrison Barnes to a team with cap space if they need to, or they can do a deal with Miami if they want to do a sign and trade or, or or what have you, they could get LeBron in. Interesting. Miami's not helping them though. Probably. If I'm Miami, I'm going down with the LeBron ship. LeBron, <laughs> like, hey, can you guys do a sign and trade? No, we can't. If you're leaving, you're leaving. We're not helping you. But if they don't need to ruin our franchise. Go ahead. There, there'll yeah. be another general manager who will take Andre Iguodala for nothing. And there'll be a there'll be a general manager who'll take Harrison Barnes for nothing, uh, and if it needs be, if they really need to get the money, there'll be somebody who'll take Andrew Bogut for nothing. And uh, there's so much money in free agency this year. There's so many teams with cap space. Uh, yeah. Golden State could do that if that's what if that's what they wanted to do. Those players are good players. Uh, other teams would take on. Let's go to the speed round of this podcast because we only we have got to like talk about Dante left. Exum. I know. Too. Okay. My first question, Dante Exum. Explain him to America in 40 seconds. 6'6", six, 6'9", six, six, wingspan, quickest athlete in the draft, uh, gets to the basket, has the killer instinct, needs to learn how to shoot, uh, and has the rest of the game. Uh, one thing about him that's really interesting is the teams that got to interview him and do the psych test on him, uniformly, Separately from each other, one of the comments that they've made about him is that he tested off the charts for them uh, in competitiveness, in all the sort of metrics that they look at the psychology of players. He's tested mm. off the charts. And then when you add an NBA type frame, he's got great size for his position and he's got NBA level athleticism, at least in speed and quickness. He's not an explosive leaper. He's an okay leaper. Uh, he's not going to jump out of the gym, but where it matters most, side to side and quickness, uh, you know, those guys tend to not fail in the NBA. And, uh, well, and then, I, I think, I think, I think that's, you know, frankly, I think that's who the Bucks should take it to uh, and pair him with Giannis. 
I think I think he's going to be a stud. Uh, and I know there's a limited amount of information to make it on, but he fit, he just clicks all the sort of categories that I think about when I think about what kind of player would I like to have on my team, a guy who can create his own shot, a guy that has elite size for his position, a guy that has huge, great basketball IQ and competitiveness. That's all the kind of stuff that I want in an 18-year-old. Yeah, you left out two crucial points, too. He's Australian. All Australians are great guys and badasses, without okay. exception. And then, two, he's 18. He turns 19 in July. You get this guy, year three in the NBA, he'll be 21. He'll, he'll be it's 21, insane. and he'll be killing people. Uh, he'll be a 21-year-old third-year NBA player. And uh, this this is interesting. One general manager said, and again, they have limited they have limited information. They they have the under 19th. They have the Nike Hoop Summit. And they have the practices. You can watch these high school games. I know the Philadelphia 76ers got 36 of his games because their head coach used to work in Australia and 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 they they were like 36 of his games. I don't know what you learned. I've watched a couple of Australian games. I have no idea what you learned uh, from them. But one general manager said he reminds me. He's the closest that I've seen to a young Kobe Bryant. Wow. And it, forget I didn't about know the point he was guard that good thing. Of an athlete. For, for, forget about the point guard thing. That's who he reminds reminds him of. And uh, you know, if that's the case, uh, if that's the case, uh, we you know we should have been as excited about him. I understand why we're not because we don't know anything. Uh, but I have a feeling had he gone to college, we would be talking about him at, right there with Wiggins and Parker, and maybe ahead of both of them. See, in my head, I was thinking. Larry Hughes 2.0. People wow. forget Larry Hughes is good, but um, you know, one of those you don't you're not sure if he's a guard or a shooting guard. Six six, good athlete, can kind of do everything. Um, you know, and if he becomes a better version of Larry Hughes, that's a really good career. But what you're telling me, I don't see the Kobe thing because Kobe was such an incredible athlete. Like even when he was 18, I. I from from the extensive YouTubing I've done of Exum, doesn't seem like he's that good of an athlete. But the Dwayne hey, Wade, God. the Dwayne Wade, like a six foot six Dwayne Wade, seems like it's in play with this kid. Okay, those are is that those fair? Are both, I, I think it's that killer. I think I think there's that killer instinct there. That you know, it's the thing that people knock on Wiggins, which I'm not a totally sure it's fair with Wiggins. I, I agree that Willer, uh, Wiggins is in an alpha dog. Uh, though I don't think he's passive either, but uh, yeah. w- with with Exum, uh, you know, badass is probably the right word. I think he's got that sort of swagger, that sort of personality, and uh, then when you factor in those physical tools and the speed, uh, and you're right, he's not a great athlete when you're talking about vertically. Um, you know, yeah. he doesn't leap like Kobe Bryant leaps, but uh, the the testing in Chicago verified the fact that this guy can get anywhere he wants on the floor laterally. And super physical, like, for instance, this is the kind of guy, and who the hell knows with these guys? He's 18. Like, he, we don't know. But this is the kind of guy that in year three of his NBA career, I wouldn't be shocked if he was averaging 10 and a half free throw attempts a game. Yeah. You know what I mean? And 1.9 steals and 1.5 blocks and five rebounds. Like, I feel like he's – the upside of this guy is just filling the box score, getting to the line, being able to play both com- both positions and showing up every night, which my fear with Wiggins is there's so much T-Mac and early T-Mac in him where he can kind of just drift and out of the games depending on how he's feeling quarter by quarter. He's so good athletically. He can kind of, you know, he he's one of those guys who can impact the game when he wants to, but he doesn't have the compelling need to do so which scares me. Um, whereas everything I've read and watched of Exxon, which is pretty limited, but um, does seem like he has that little extra something. Yep. So. And, I, and I, I think that's how teams feel about him. And, I, you know, it takes a lot of guts. We go back to this with these general managers to draft that guy like that ahead of players that you have scouted more and have, have a much more of a track record. And and I, I think he'll be a big transition in year one. I, I think coming from Australian high school basketball to the NBA is a, a massive leap. But the, the people made that same mistake with Giannis Antetokounmpo last year 
And I was one of them. I, you know, talked about the fact that this guy is playing in the second, third division in Greece. There's YMCA games happening in the U.S. that are more competitive than those games. And, of course, when mm. you get this long, athletic 6'10 guy in there, he looks incredible playing against these guys. But there's no way he's going to play in the NBA next year. He played. Uh, because they, you know, if you want to hand it to John Hammond on one end, he recognized when he drafted this kid, this is our future. We've got to make it work. We're going to do the same thing Dallas did with Dirk Nowitzki. He's completely not ready, but the only way he gets ready is to get in there every night and have to play with these guys. And by the end of the season, we're like, this guy probably should have been the number one pick in the draft. And, uh, and I think Exum's that same sort of play. So in Chadford mock draft 9.0, you had Exum going third, which I was bummed out by because that was going to be one of my pet predictions all week. I think Philly's taking Exum. And not just for all the reasons we talked about, but I think Sam Hinkie long-term is perfectly happy with taking two guys that are either projects or assets to file away. Like, I think they're going to take Sarich at 10 because you can just tuck them away. The, the key thing for Philly is if they're terrible again, that's another top four pick. So now you have Michael Carter Williams, you have Nerlens Noel, Exum, you got Sarich at 10, and then top five pick to be named in a year. Now all of a sudden you have five dudes that you're building around. Um, and I think they think that way. I think they're looking, they don't, they don't care about being good next year. They're thinking about assets. They, they um, are. I actually think that I, 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 I've had Sarge there at 10 for a while. That, that not for two years does complicate things a bit, that he's not going to come for two years. It means you don't get him next year. I think a lot of people were prepared that they were going to lose him for a year, but that it's two and it could be possibly three. He's making good money uh, over over in Europe uh, playing for Ephesus now uh, are, are all concerns. But what about this? Because I, I think this this is this is an option for them. Uh, the Lakers, I think, in a heartbeat, would trade the number seven pick to them for Thaddeus Young and Michael Carter Williams. Yeah. Then at seven, they go get a big. Can I ask uh, you a question? Why does Thaddeus Young even have to be in that trade? He, he probably doesn't. I, I just think actually Philly Philly's going to move him. Isn't uh, seven? Isn't seven for Michael Carter Williams? A fair trade? I would argue that I'd rather have the seventh pick than Michael Carter-Williams, but I, I'm lower on Michael w- Carter-Williams than other people. And I, 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 th- and I think Philly is, too. I mean, I, th- I think Philly understands his value may never be higher than it is right now because he won Rookie of the Year. There's these teams that feel like I, we don't want to train a rookie. We want somebody with experience. You can sell Carter Williams because, you know, he, he's already played for a season. He's already 22 years old. He was an old rookie, remember? Uh, he's already 22 years old. He's four years older than some of the players that are he's coming. He's going to be 23 this year. Yeah, 23 this year. Uh, yeah. I, I, this is an asset thing. Everybody's like, well, why would Philly trade the one guy that they had next year? Because Philly thinks about assets, and right now, Michael Carter-Williams is overvalued as an asset. Trade him for the number seven pick. By the way, the number seven pick in this year's draft would have went number one last year. Not <laughs> I think number the 11 number like eight Michael Carter-Williams. Would have went number one. Yeah. And, I'm uh, with you. And, and then get Julius Randle. Or Aaron Gordon or Noah Vonley, whoever falls there. Now you've got a a, a, a true power forward, or especially if it's it's Vonley or Randall to put next to Nerlens Noel. Uh, you still have the third pick. Now you have Dante Exum. You still have ten. You could go get Sarich, or you could go another way and get a Nick Stauskas or somebody to go spread the floor and and, and shoot the basketball, uh, something like that. And that's a better it's a better play for assets. They'll get their butts kicked next year. You can't start four rookies and not get your butt butt kicked. But they don't care about that. They'll go hey, get another prospect next year. Uh, it's the NBA's a, first hedge fund team. That's another deal that just makes so much sense to me uh, because the Lakers want to win now, and they'll, they'll be able to rationalize bringing Thaddeus Young and Michael Carter-Williams gives them two for the price of one. Carter-Williams still a young player. Thaddeus Young in his prime, not not it adds the athleticism of the team. Then they can use their free agent money to go and sign you know sign a couple of bigs and and be back and competitive in, in the West again. And, and Philly keeps gathering assets. It, to me, that's a it's a it's a no-brainer for the Lakers, and, and I actually think it's it's a no-brainer for the Sixers because I think Dante Exum is a better point guard prospect than Michael Carter Williams, and I think the number seven pick in the draft is better than anything that they got in last year's draft, with the possible and exception just, of Nerlens Noel. I think Sacramento would be in play for Michael Carter Williams too at number eight. And that's another one. Uh, they they could do it at eight. Why not? 
I mean, you could even argue Charlotte at number nine would be interested. Put him with Kemba. Uh, I, you're, I, you're right. I guess Young though. too would be a, Thaddeus Young would be another same another player that'd be very interesting to them as well. I don't mind the excellent Michael Carter Williams backcourt though. On paper, I like having the two tall guys that could play their position and take turns dribbling and. I don't know. I, I kind of like that, but I, I'm I'm a little lower on him. And I also, I thought he developed some bad habits as the season went along last year. They put him in a really bad situation. He was chasing the rookie of the year. He was chasing his stats to some degree. And and uh, I don't know. It, it's interesting to me that you've been reporting that they were shopping him at least quietly for a little while, and a couple other people have too. If that guy was on my team and I wasn't shopping him, I would hold a press conference and say, look. We don't know where these reports are coming from. We are not shopping this guy. He's the rookie of the year. He's the foundation of our franchise. He's not going anywhere. You have my word. Like, whatever you need to do. They're not doing that. They're kind of just letting this stuff happen, which makes me think that they are shopping him. They are shopping um, him. I've talked to a number of yeah. teams that have had discussions with him about it. Now, I think they're going to give him away. Sam Hinkie's not. it's not like a fire sale where they have to give him away. But, again... You know, this is from the school, and Danny Ainge is the same way. I have an asset. If you can offer me something that's more valuable than this asset, I'm going to take him. And I think they know exactly who he is now. And I think they know what kind of person he is and what kind of leader he is and, and what he can do on a good team. I think the coaching staff knows now. I think the front office knows. And they know better than every other team in the league because they've had him for a year. So you think Orlando, you reported, they're offering 4-12 and 12. And a Flalo, and or a Flalo to move up into the top three because they're getting the sinking suspicion that Jabari and Exum and Wiggins are all going to be gone when they're picking at four. Um, do they have any chance to trade up? Well, uh, yeah, I, I'll give you the scenario where I think either Philly, Orlando, or Utah gets to move up. And that that's if Cleveland says at the end of the day, because, you know, we have them taking Jabari right now. I don't know why they're off Wiggins, you know, if they are. And Dante Exum, I, you know, I guess makes sense there for the same reason that Michael Carter-Williams and, and Dante Exum makes sense. But they say, you know, look, we're not we're not in love with these guys. We're not. So, But we did love Joel Embiid. We loved him. So let's, let's have the best of both worlds here. Let's take Thaddeus Young or Aaron Oflalo or Derek Favors. I think of the three, Derek Favors is probably the most intriguing to them. And then let's draft Joel Embiid. And, and we get a guy who helps our team next year, which is something that our owner wants. We get value for the pick because we get an NBA-level starter, if not even a little bit better than a starter caliber player in return. And we get the guy who we thought was the best player in the draft. And, and even if it turns out that his foot's a problem down the road, we still got value for this pick. And, and I could see Cleveland on draft night taking whoever they take because, you know, there's teams that are interested in Jabari. There's teams that are interested in Wiggins, uh, maybe even I in Utah especially. And then they watch where Embiid falls. They watch which team takes Embiid, and then they call them up and they make the deal. And if, it's, if, if it goes to Utah at five, then they make the deal. Uh, if, it, you know, if Orlando jumps in ahead of time and takes him, they make the deal and they, they add a follow to the team. Uh, you know, or Thaddeus Young. That, to me, is a smart use of your pick, in my opinion, especially if you're not in love with Jabari and you're not in love with Wiggins. And uh, and I, I think you look like a genius down the road because you still have your big man of the future and you helped your team right away this year. If I had Cleveland pick, I would offer it to Philly for 3-10. and 10. I don't think Philly would do it because I think Sam Henke is too smart. And yeah, I don't think he'll offer 10 enough. or 3. No, because he knows it's enough of a crapshoot that you're better off taking chances at three and ten, and you'll have a better chance of landing a better asset than just taking one. Yeah. Then I would offer number one to Orlando for four and twelve. I think Orlando would think about that, and I actually think it's a fair trade. And then if you're Cleveland, you move down to four. You take whoever's left out of the out of the out of the. Embiid, Wiggins, Parker, Exum, whoever's left you get, and then you get 12, and 12 is a really, really good pick in this draft. Yeah. Somebody's yeah. good is going to fall to 12. Um, I would do that. I think that makes the most sense. I, I think um, the one thing, though, is Cleveland, I think there's a lot of pressure for them to walk away with somebody that's going to help them next year. And uh, Pressure on who? I, I, just, I don't understand that, though. They're, the pressure on them should be to build a good team. 
Yeah, but that's and not how Dan Gilbert thinks. If they can get four thinks. and twelve for that pick, you you got to do it. You're trying to build a juggernaut. You he, know, this and is a guy who promised that he, this is a guy who promised his fan base that they'd win a title before LeBron. Uh, this is a guy I who know, pr- stood up and promised last year that this team was going to be the playoffs and they were done with the lottery yeah, and then fired their general manager uh, midseason. Uh, when even right. after he drafted the guy that Gilbert intervened and made sure that he drafted, uh, in part because yep. they thought Bennett could help them right away. Um, I don't think David Griffin's sitting around now saying, yeah, I have time to develop young players. Uh, I don't think that's how he feels. And the funny thing is Dan Gilbert is raking in money with Quicken Loans. Just makes incredible amounts of money. He's probably going to be the, one of the world's richest men in like a year. And for some reason, cannot figure out how to run a basketball team. Um, hey, maybe maybe he'll figure it out at some point. What does Utah do at five? You have Aaron Gordon going to them, which scares me because that's the guy I wanted for the Celtics. Yeah, I know you do, and and I I think I think that's the guy the Celtics want for the Celtics uh, as well. If they if they're just they're just sitting there, um, the uh, the Jazz liked three guys. They liked Exum. It makes a lot of sense there. Trey Burke's undersized. I don't really think Trey Burke ultimately is the starting point guard on a great NBA team. Uh, he's a nice, nice backup or an okay point guard on a mediocre team. Uh, they liked Vonley uh, because he gave them something that their other bigs didn't give, which is the ability to stretch the floor. Uh, and uh, they really liked, I think, the combination of him and and, uh, uh, and Favors together. And it takes some pressure off them to have to re-sign and as Cantor to a big number because you know Cantor is going to get a huge offer because he's just a big uh, and young as yep. a restricted free agent, and, and Utah's not going to be able to afford it. Uh, and then they liked Gordon, and, and part of the reason I think they liked Gordon was that they, this is a team that's had some experience, knowing what a guy who doesn't necessarily is a great offensive juggernaut, not a guy who's going to average 20 points a night, but a guy that can, through effort, motor, incredible athleticism and length, can make a difference. Uh, on a basketball team, and while he's not the star that they build around, he's that guy, that X factor that they also don't have on the on their roster. And, uh, and I, I think they may have preferred Vonley, and they may have preferred Exum, but I, I think in in many ways it takes pressure off you when those guys are off the board to take a guy like Gordon, who uh, I'm I'm with you. I, I think if if he learns how to shoot uh, even a little bit and can shoot free throws better than at 42 percent. Uh, he's going to have a really good NBA career. He's the Matrix. That's his destiny. He's going to be Matrix 2.0. It's going to happen. Um, I, I just think, for me, he's the Westbrook kind of kind of guy in this draft. And it doesn't happen every draft, but sometimes it's ha- it happens. Where, like Westbrook, what was it six years ago? You just knew he was going to be something. You didn't know what position it was going to be. You didn't know exactly how he was going to be used, but you just, from watching him in college, it just, he was just an electric athlete and he was so competitive. And it was just like, that dude's going to figure it out. I just have faith that that guy's going to figure it out. And that's how I feel about Gordon. Like it, it's an incomplete jigsaw puzzle right now, but you just look at the athleticism and the competitiveness and the game savvy and he's a gym rat. And it's just all the stuff I like. I just think he figures it out and they'll figure out how to shoot. I, I, I don't say that all the time, but in this case, he'll figure out how to make corner threes. That's all he's going to have to do is make corner threes, right? I think even – I'm not saying he's this type of player, but even the better analogy to the draft was Kawhi Leonard, who played a very similar position. Wasn't the athlete that Gordon was, but same guy, intangibles, yeah. filled up a box score every night, absolute gym rat, loved the game. Everybody loved Kawhi Leonard who met him. Hey, and that's one, a constant with Aaron Gordon. Every interview, they come away and say that was one of the best interviews in the draft. His teammates love yep. him. He's infectious. And everybody in that draft said, yeah, but he can't shoot. And I'm not really sure whether he's a three or a four. And so, therefore, we're going to pass on him. And now he's the finals MVP. Uh, Aaron Gordon is, is, is almost everything except Aaron Gordon's actually a better athlete than Kawhi Leonard. Actually, considerably better right. athlete than Kawhi Leonard. Yeah. Uh, that's – and, you know, that, that that's – but all those other similarities are very, very close to Kawhi. And you know I judge all my draft prospects by the question, could they have played in the finals I just watched? You could have thrown Aaron Gordon into that finals for 20 minutes, and he would have run around. He might have been a little nervous, but athletically and competitively, he could have survived. 
Yeah. And I'm not sure you could say that about a lot of these top 10 guys. Yeah. And um, once his body starts to fill out a little bit, he's yeah. a guy who could guard LeBron. Oh, yeah. It will, LeBron, Durant. Um, he's also somebody that, you know, he could be a stretch forward depending on what team you're playing in. The, the flexibility that he gives you is going to be really important. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking you. So you have Embiid going to the Celtics at number six, which I would love. Uh, I think it would be, I think it would be an incredible stroke of luck. It's a great gamble at that point in the draft. I just can't imagine he falls to six. It's inconceivable to me. I, th- I think at four, if Orlando doesn't want to take him, somebody trades into that spot. I, I just can't see him dropping past four. Somebody is going to say to themselves, that guy is a franchise center. We're getting him, and they're going to trade up to number four. Um, do you think that is realistic? Yeah, uh, I, and I think Orlando would be open to it. I, I think part of Orlando's problem, Philly's, Philly's problem is, so Philly's problem a little bit is they did that with Noel that last year. Are they going to do it again with Embiid this year, especially with Adante Exum uh, on the table? Yep. I, that, that's the challenge for them. For Orlando, it's we've been in the rebuilding process a little longer than these other teams, and and now we're taking a guy next year, and he's not even going to play for us, and you know, and we're going to move a Flalo, and we're going, we're going to be bad again. And then this is a challenge with Embiid. He wasn't the most NBA ready of the top guys, and now he, he developmentally, now he misses an entire year at a critical time of development. He's it's not like he's going to come back a year from now and be a thirty-five minute and you know eighteen point ten rebound a night guy. He's not going to be. He's going to foul out of a lot of games. He's going to be rusty. It's going to be it's going to be a while. You're not going to really know what you have with Joel until probably the end of your second year, um, third year. And uh, and that timetable isn't great for for Rob Hennigan, I don't think. I think I think he 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 doesn't feel like he has that job security to wait that long to add another impact player to this team when there's so much good, good players in the draft. So yeah, if there's a trade there, I think Utah's in the same boat. I think they sold their owner. We're going to dip down and be bad for one year. We're going to go get this great pick, and then we're going to put everything together and be back as a playoff contender next year. Now you got to say, you know, actually we're going to take Embiid. And uh, he's not going to play for us at all next year. And we're going to be bad or worse next year. And and then he's going to come back the next year, and he's not really going to be ready to play. And, you know, he's not going to really be an impact player there. So now you've got to sell your owner on a, on a minimum of two more years of going through this process. And I'm not sure that Utah can, Utah can do it as well. That, that's the only reason it, four and five, I think, become problematic. Well, it's interesting because Boston – they're in a weird situation because they have a coach who took the losing last year really, 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 really hard. Didn't enjoy it. Not a big fan of losing 57 of 82 games. And now you're telling him, hey, we have a chance to get Kevin Love. We're trying to get him, blah, blah, blah. Now you go the other way. You keep the pick, and you take somebody who can't play basically for the entire first season and in year two is going to be learning on the job. And they have real concerns about – you know, the next time a great college job jumps open, whether it's UNC or Indiana or Duke someday, who the hell knows, does Stevens go back to college? They're worried about keeping him happy. That would be the only way I don't see them taking a beat. I also know the Celtics are a team that really trusts their medical staff about as much as anyone. And if their medical staff says, do not take this guy, they won't. They'll take somebody else. Then you look at the Lakers at seven. Um, they can't do it. I don't think they, they can't can do take it. a beat. I don't think they can eat. Well, if they did, they're basically just antagonizing Kobe, right? Uh, I, I can't imagine they can take take MB. They have to have this asset either help them right now as a player or trade it for somebody who will help them. So maybe let's say MB MB falls to seven, which would be improbable. I'd be stunned. I'd, I'd be absolutely flabbergasted if that happened. But let's say he falls to seven. At that point, maybe Philly does come in with the Michael Carter Williams trade for the Lakers. Hey, here you go. We'll throw in Thad Young, too. Take him. Please. I think this is why it's going to be such an exciting draft, because I absolutely think it's going to be this sort of gamemanship with Embiid, this asset now. That's what he is now. He's an asset. And Mm -hmm. who takes him? Maybe not even thinking that we're going to keep him just because we know he's an asset. Um, And I don't know what Arn Tellum's going to tell teams. I mean, this is the other thing. We don't even know what the agent is going to share yet. 
right. uh, and what teams he's going to share it with. And so you could really be drafting blind. I and, have a you, – you know every year I fall in love with a player based yeah. on what I read and yes. just random stupid things? Yes. This year's player is Alfred Payton. Oh, that's my guy. Well, he was your guy. We we're going to share him because – I love everything I've read about this guy. Um, and the more I look at it, Jalen and I did a little mock draft on Friday. If Sacramento keeps that pick, I think they should take him because that's a team that needs a leader and just a great guy and a professional and just a stabilizing force and somebody who's literally there just to serve everyone else and make everyone else better and bring a little fire and a little spunk and a little character and everything that Sacramento has desperately needed basically for the last 12 years. Um, why wouldn't they take him eight if they kept the pick? They don't know what they're doing. Uh, because uh, I think Alfred Payton is the closest thing I've seen to young Gary Payton, both in yeah. his body type, the way he plays the game, even his demeanor. Uh, this is a tough kid, a very tough, tough kid. Uh, and when I met him uh, and his father, uh, it, it took me about five minutes to say, okay, I know what this is about um, and who this kid's going to be. Starts college at 17. Uh, is brought on at the last minute by Team USA to pri- pri- provide some defense and you know just, just to round out their roster. Ends up blowing away people in practice at how hard he's going after Marcus Smart to the point that he ends, a, ends up with a starting position. Leads the NCAA in free throw attempts this year. I and, love that stat. That's my favorite. And and I watched him. I watched him work out in, in Thousand Oaks, and kick everybody's butt on the floor. Nobody could stay in front of him. And he's playing against uh, other lottery type prospects. Uh, and they brought in a few NBA players, and it was the same thing. Uh, kick everybody's butt on the floor. When T.J. Warren was out there dominating on everybody, and T.J. Warren to me is one of the most intriguing players in the draft, him and Kyle Anderson, because you don't understand how their game translates at all, but there's just something intriguing about both of them because of the way they play the game. Uh, Kicking everybody's butt on the floor, he opts off C.J. Wilcox and says, I'll guard the 6'8 guy because I'm sick of him scoring on us every time. And this is just a pick-up three-on-three. You know, you see that sort of attitude, and then you hear every workout, he basically draws with Marcus Smart. Uh, yeah. Most every team walked away and said, you know, if you didn't know, those two guys, I mean, they, they both went at it hard because, you know, Marcus Smart's not going to back down from anybody. Uh, they went at each other. Marcus Smart's been bulldozing everybody else in these workouts, um, except Alfred Payton. Uh, now, if Marcus Smart was there at eight, uh, you know, I think that's a legitimate question mark about between those two guys because uh, I, I, I like Marcus Smart a lot too, and I and I certainly would be defensible for them to have Marcus Smart come in, especially because I, I think he could also transform that culture uh, in Sacramento as well. And I'm not sure there's anybody that would stand up to Marcus Smart. I think it would scare everybody away. Uh, but Alfred Payton, <laughs> Alfred Payton's right there to me um, with Marcus Smart. That's the caliber of prospect he is. Yeah. And remember, when Gary Payton came out of college, people said he couldn't shoot he and couldn't, couldn't shoot. dribble. Yeah. Um, so it's basically. But he was also the number two pick in the draft. Yeah. And people are like, well, was, well, we'll see how and, it goes. And, and, and had Alfred Payton played for a, a Pac-12 school or an ACC school or an SEC school, uh, he would be a top five pick in the draft. I'm a huge fan is, And I like the more I study Marcus Smart, I like him more than I thought I did because he's so freaking competitive. We'll figure it out. He'll he, figure it out. It's the number one trait you want. And that guy is the most competitive guy in this draft. He's a psychopath. And it, it's it's a good quality that as he gets older and matures a little bit, I think it'll manifest itself in a positive way. I have no idea what position he is. I mean, he's basically, can you say like a little taller version of Eric Bledsoe, where it's like I I don't know what position he's going to play, but he's going to have a dramatic impact on games. Yeah, I don't even worry about it. He's a basketball yeah. player. Yeah, and, and he, him out there. He, he can play enough point. He can play enough two. I don't worry about it. I mean, people get caught up on that. The question to me about position is, can he defend a position? And the answer is he can defend both. He can defend right. ones and twos. So uh, I don't care what he is. You know, whatever he ends up being, he's going to be an impact player. Um, no, what's what's up? Like, we agree with everything. We agree with each well, other. Well, this has everybody. been happening lately. Well, with, with Smart, his worst-case scenario is he's going to be an awesome version of Tony Allen. Yeah, that's your worst-case yeah. scenario. Yeah, and, and a guy that's, you know uh, – uh, not not in so much trouble off the court as Tony Allen, right? Right. Um, we're probably split on McDermott. 
I, I worry him? about McDermott. Yeah. Do you love him? No, I, I, you know, I love the one elite skill guys, but I just. No, I don't love him either. So we're not even going to split on him. Okay. Stauskas, I love. I don't love him as much as some of the guys we just talked about, but there's no question he's a an NBA guy who's going to affect He can shoot games. and he's cocky, and those yeah. those two go together well. Uh, he's not shy. You know, Mike Miller can really shoot it, but you know, Mike Miller sometimes seems hesitant to shoot it. Yeah. Um, this this guy has no conscience. He's going to let it fly from anywhere. And one of the things I love is he gets off the shot in all sorts of settings. You know, he doesn't. He just needs a second, and it's gone. Uh, maybe he can be what we'd all hope Jimmer would be. Well, he'd be the most fun Phoenix Sun. We can all agree on that. If he somehow falls to 14, the world is a better place. Yeah. I really like Gary Harris. I do, um, too. I'm shocked by how many guys in this draft I like. It might have the highest percentage of guys I like because I love Sarge, too. And you have the Celtics getting Sarge at 17. I think, first of all, I'm going to be on TV when this happens. I think I would go in a coma if that happened. Uh, you got- if they got Sarge at 17, that would be the steal of the draft. Oh, yeah, it God. would be. And then I even kind of like Zach Levine, even though uh, – Zach yeah. Levine, sorry. Even though, um, you know, he's the classic sucks you in with his potential but never actually pans out guy. But, God damn, my, my UCLA friends who watched them just said he was just a freak. Yeah, and, and, if, and, he, and, and if he pans out, he'll be a top right. five player in this draft. If he yeah. pans out. Oh, and FYI, I like TJ Warren. There's no doubt he is an NBA player. He will figure it out. And uh, and I like Clay Anthony early to come back and haunt everybody who doesn't take him in round one. It's going to happen. Okay. I've got to run. No? Yeah, you have to go. That's it. Chad Ford is out. Uh, we didn't get through everybody. But we you, you have one more mock draft in you. You have a whole bunch of other stuff. Yep. And uh, as always, fantastic job. Good talking yep. to you. And we can do a part two at any time. You let me know. Yeah, we'll do one after. All right. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. All right, bye. Before we go, I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, Jalen and I are on the NBA draft preview on ESPN on Wednesday night, and then we are covering the draft on Thursday live with Jay Billis and Reese Davis. It should be a blast. Uh, I, I've, I've never been more psyched for a draft from a what the hell is going to happen standpoint. I think this one has the most questions we've ever had in a draft. Anybody who knows, anybody who says they know what's going to happen is crazy. And is lying.